Tonight, the moderator of the General Assembly, Right Honourable Lord Wallace of Tankerness. That's the last time I'm going to say that. Again. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Jim's wife, Lady Rosie. We're delighted that you're here. Oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> well, keep going. All right, okay. We, uh, we obviously haven't had this service in person during the pandemic, and so we're especially delighted that we can be in person tonight, albeit perhaps not in the usual way that this service would take place. But we're here, and we rejoice in that fact. Can I ask you at the conclusion of the service, uh, so that we are still following our restrictive procedures that you uh, adhere to instructions by the stewards when you're due to leave. Now, the, those of you who are going to get your photographs taken, again, you'll be asked to come to this area, the transept, to get your, your photograph taken. If you're leaving immediately uh, after the conclusion of the service, again, the stewards will instruct you when and how you're going to leave. So don't panic. Uh, you'll get home, don't worry, uh, everything will be fine. Can I also ask you that if you have a mobile phone, if you could either put it on silent or, or switch it off, uh, especially with organs playing in the background. <laughs> now I think these are all the intimations. Let us worship God. Let us sing to his praise and to his glory the hymn your hand, O oh God, has guided your flock from age to age.
actually confess a sin of omission. I forgot to welcome those who are joining us online this evening. A very warm welcome to you also, and please feel very much at home with us. We are joined together, perhaps not in each other's presence, but we are joined certainty, certainly together in heart and in spirit. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock, and with his arm keep them together. Let us pray. Lead us, God of goodness, lead us into those places where your mercy waits to nourish our weary souls, where your grace feeds our famished hearts. Lead us, gentle shepherd, lead us to those sanctuaries of hope where we have the joy of filling the emptiness of others, because the table you have set has room enough for everyone. Lead us, Holy Spirit, place our feet on your right paths, walking us down the streets where we can do justice for all who are wronged in the world. Lead us to those gentle pools where we can fill ourselves, then go to empty them for those parched by loss. Lead us, God in community, holy in one, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is now. reading is from Ruth chapter 1 verses 6 to 18. Naomi and her Moabite daughters-in-law. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her do two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, because I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons. Would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well. 
and even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Our second reading tonight is from Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 10, the conversion of Saul. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision. A man named Ananias came in and laid his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before, the, before Gentiles and kings, and before people, the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Our third reading is Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. Jesus calls the first disciples. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat, with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Amen. We continue our worship, we sing the hymn number, no we don't sing the hymn number anything, we sing the hymn, next hymn on your order of service, will you come and follow me? my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm very grateful to the minister of High Hilton Parish Church, uh, Hutton Steele, and to the Presbytery of Aberdeen and Shetland for this invitation to address this Presbytery service during my visit to the city of Aberdeen, where I shall also be marking the University of Aberdeen's Founders Day. It is an opportunity for me to engage with both members of the Presbytery as well as those working and studying in Aberdeen's ancient university. So to all of you, both here in this sanctuary and online, I bring the warm greetings and good wishes of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. Aberdeen is a city and has an airport which I've come to know very well during the last 39 years. Not only is it a place where I have regularly changed planes on my commutes between the Northern Isles and London, but the links between Orkney and Shetland on the one hand and Aberdeen on the other has meant that over the years there have been numerous occasions when I have been here for meetings with one body or another. 
And these, and such are these links, that I'm particularly conscious that this is now the presbytery of Aberdeen and Shetland. The latter being a place which for 18 years I had the privilege to represent in Parliament, and which will always be a place with which I feel a very close affinity. Now, any moderator is very wise not to anticipate decisions of the General Assembly, but an educated guess might suggest that before too long, there will be closer presbytery bonds between people here and those in Orkney, where I have had my home for the best part of four decades. Change is afoot, and looking at the church, at our country, and at the world, I cannot help but think that we may well be living in significant and momentous times. The challenges facing the Kirk are only too familiar to presbyters and members present. At the General Assembly, we passed a new Presbytery Mission Plan Act, within which we agreed to reduce the number of ministry posts to 600 plus 60 vacancies. And as people here will be only too well aware, working that through is the difficult bit. As a country, we are emerging from one of the most turbulent peacetime episodes in recent history. COVID-19 has challenged many old certainties, the kaleidoscope has been well and truly shaken up, and we live in a country in which thousands have known death, serious illness, isolation, unemployment, employment insecurity, increased poverty, lost educational time, and many of the mental health issues which flow from all that. We have a country in need of healing and of coming together to rebuild. But as a country and a world, we face not only recovery from the pandemic, but a looming global climate change challenge. Last August, the United Nations Secretary General described the latest analytical report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as code red for humanity. It warned of increasingly extreme heat waves of droughts and flooding caused by human activity. And whilst some steps forward were identified at COP26, there is no room for complacency and much to be done to hold world leaders to the pledges they made. So against that background, the temptation sometimes, rather than get up in the morning, might be to pull the duvet even more tightly over your head. But as people of faith, we are simply not defeatist. I was recently introduced to the choral music of Philip Stockford, and I've taken much encouragement from his piece do not be afraid, based on words from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord who created us says, do not be afraid, I will save you. When you pass through deep waters, I will be with you. Do not be afraid, I am with you. That is a firm reassurance. And Jesus, who is the comforter? It's also the Jesus who said to Simon, Peter, and Andrew, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Indeed, the theme for the 2021 General Assembly was immediately they left their nets and followed him. In this evening's readings, we heard of two biblical characters, Ruth and Ananias, who in their different ways left things behind and followed. Ruth followed her mother-in-law Naomi, and in doing so she left behind her home, her lifestyle, her blood family, her domestic Moabite culture and traditions and idols to follow Naomi and God. It's a wholly voluntary act on Ruth's part. Indeed, it's more than that, for she could have continued life in her native Moabite country but she was determined, almost to the point of obstinacy, to prove her loyalty and faith in standing by Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. So we see in Ruth someone who follows, displaying loyalty, love, and obedience. Ananias, on the other hand, was initially not so keen to follow the Lord's call, to go and welcome Saul to Damascus and to restore Saul's sight. 
After all, he'd heard so many reports about Saul that he was in little doubt that the purpose of his visit to Damascus was to persecute people like him. So Ruth's determination is a counterpart to Ananias' reluctance. It was wholly counterintuitive for Ananias to voluntarily enter Saul's presence. But at the second time of asking, Ananias is willing to leave behind his doubts, leave behind his misgivings, and is obedient in following Jesus' command. He salutes Saul as my brother. He restores his sight and baptizes him. And almost immediately, Saul is proclaiming Jesus publicly in the synagogue. The first fruits of a very bountiful harvest. Two contrasting ways of following where God calls. But both cases involve leaving something behind. A familiar, possibly even comfortable lifestyle in Ruth's case, and an understandable fear for his own security on the part of Ananias. And in both cases, obedience to God's call is crucial to the unfolding of God's purpose. They both lead to pivotal points in the human story. For Ruth's marriage to Boaz produces Obed, the grandfather of King David. And Ananias' embrace of Saul launches the most amazing missionary journey in history. So as we emerge from lockdown and pandemic, and as our church faces radical structural change, many see this as a pivotal point. So what path do we, individually, as a nation, as a church, take? What former routines, previous practices and policies are we prepared to give up? to let go of, to leave behind as we seek today to follow Jesus in faith and obedience. It will come as no surprise to you to learn that from different parts of Scotland I hear about the angst, both anticipated and real, relating to the publication and development of presbytery mission plans. Change, uncertainty and potentially letting go is hugely difficult and can readily lead to profound anxiety and disappointment. So this surely must be a time for those of us in leadership to show awareness and to show sensitivity, and for colleagues to exercise pastoral care for each other, mindful of Paul's exhortation to the church in Thessalonica. Encourage one another and build each other up. And it's essential not to lose sight of what the goal is that we are striving for. Speaking to divinity students in Glasgow last week, <clears throat> one of them picked me up on the use of the somewhat shorthand term presbytery plan, reminding me that we are, of course, talking about the Presbytery Mission Plan Act. And of course, the Act requires that plans ensure that the life of the Church of Scotland is shaped around mission and adequately reflects the outcomes of local church review and ideas for local mission. As my predecessor Martin Fair said in his very powerful valedictory address to the General Assembly, the sooner we sort structures, the sooner we can get to what really matters, proclaiming the good news of the Kingdom. During last summer, I read a book by uh, American Episcopalian pastor Alan J. Roxburgh. The book's got an exceptionally long, challenging, and somewhat ambitious title Joining God, Remaking Church, Changing the World. And although written pre COVID from a North American perspective, its starting point is what he describes as the unraveling of the Euro tribal churches, an all too familiar story of declining numbers of ageing congregations, of strategy plans which never quite succeed in reversing the trend. But far from being downbeat, Roxburgh believes that the spirit is disrupting and calling our churches into a new imagination about what it means to follow in the way of Jesus. That affirming sentence, the spirit is disrupting and calling our churches into a new imagination about what it means to follow the way of Jesus. That has come to mind on a number of occasions during visits I've made over the last nine months. A 
the Greyfriars Charter Centre in Edinburgh. There's an imaginative use of a church building linked to the name of Dr. Archibald Charters, who in his day, through his work in establishing the Guild, Life and Work and the Diaconate, pioneered new and visionary ways of following in the way of Jesus. And at Greyfriars Charter Centre, we have innovative partnerships and an imaginative use of space. An example of the church reaching out into a very diverse and lively community in new forms of mission. It's far from unique. In October, I visited the gate in Alloa, witnessed outreach to a vulnerable community from a former church building, inspired and supported by congregation members. Volunteers support a drop-in soup pot, a community cafe, a food bank, and provision of starter packs for people who have been newly housed. Lochie Parish Church in Dundee celebrated its 150th anniversary with the rededication of the sanctuary, now a refurbished building at the heart of the local community, a modern place of worship and a lively place and a community space which welcomes people in and a place from where the ministry team and congregation reach out into the community of Loch Ee. On last Sunday, in the sanctuary of St Cuthbert's in Edinburgh, I shared an evening meal with over 80 people, many homeless and many trying to find a way to recover from addiction and substance abuse. Just some examples of mission by congregations seeking to follow Jesus into their community. And if there are challenges for the church, there are also challenges for our country and communities in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. So now surely must be a time for a new imagining of what our country can be. We cannot go back to the world before COVID, where, as the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, described it, the most powerful and the richest gain, and so many fall behind. Rather, as a church, we must be eager to share the gospel message of love. Love, which in the public arena manifests itself as justice. And justice, which puts the needs of the poor or the vulnerable, those afflicted by mental health problems or the refugee, at the top of the agenda. Let us, in the words of Pope Francis, harness the eruption of fraternity. Let us not slip back into our old ways, but rather build on the neighbourly love, generosity and concern which was forged in the crisis of COVID. And as a church, let us not only respond in love to our common renewal post-COVID, but in hope, in faith, in prayer and in compassion. Let us help to shape that renewal through our engagement in the community. Ruth was prepared to leave behind the security and familiarity of home and her people, to follow and to venture forward into what became a pivotal new beginning. Ananias overcame his fears and doubts to follow where God willed and played a crucial role in the pivotal new mission of spreading the good news. In his book Rewilding the Church, Steve Aesthop says, When the Spirit is blowing, we need to be prepared to cast off, raise the sails, and commit to a journey towards an unknown destination. So let us not be afraid. This time of change, challenge and uncertainty can be a time of opportunity if in faith we are sensitive to and ready to follow the Spirit into a new imagining. Moderator, uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of the congregation tonight when I, th I thank you for these very encouraging and appropriate words for us here tonight but also as the church in Scotland and also as a nation we are indebted to you. Thank you. Friends, we now come to the, well it says presentation of long service certificates. 
The one thing we have to deviate from this normal service is that uh, we are going to do this congregation by congregation and my uh, colleagues at the back will come forward uh, when it is their church that uh, members who are being acknowledged for their service. Uh, so when your name is read, I ask you to stand in your place as a congregation and we shall acknowledge each congregation as we go through. I hope that's clear. I hope it's clear to all of you. That makes sense, Well, uh, one of the elders is <laughs> 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 Thank you, moderator, for the reminder that when you retire this year, I will be the senior minister in the presbytery by ordination. Oh, that makes you feel like Methuselah. <laughs> so as the moderator of presbytery has said, I will read out the names from Craigie Butler and invite you to stand. David Bruce, Brian Bryce, Alexander Cowie, James Reaper and John Smith. And from Ferry Hill Parish Church, Lorna Glenn and Agnes MacDonald. Thank you both. From Holborn West Church, uh, Mrs. Lillian Duncan and Mrs. Jill Redman and Mrs. Jennifer Brisk. Not all ministers and inter moderators could be here this evening, so uh, I'm wearing the number 12 shirt for one or two congregations. Now the turn of King's Wells Parish Church, uh, and we start with Mr. David Buckmeyer, Mrs. Aileen Glenn, Mrs. Lorna Graham, Professor Jeff Maxwell, old friend of High Hilton, and Mrs. Chris Maxwell, and Mrs. Anne Roger. And from Peter Cooter Paris Church, Mr. Neil Lane, and Mr. Eric Steen. And from Manifield Parish Church, Mrs. Jean Anderson, Dr. Derek Bain, Mr. Nicol Geddes, Mr. Ian Hunter, Mr. John Little, Mr. James Ruxton, Mr. John Telfer, and Mrs. Fiona Ewer. Rutherstone West, Mrs. Sheila Belfort. And we come to the Cathedral Church of St. Macker, Mrs. Sheila Cameron, 
Mrs. Margaret McCauley, Mrs. Leslie McNabb, Mrs. Catherine Mason, and Mrs. Sandra Massey. And St. Mary's Parish Church. This is Janice Hutchison, Mr. Michael Ryrie, and Mrs. Margaret Took. And from South Holborn Parish Church. Mr. George Christie, Mrs. Dorothy Fraser, Mrs. Myrtle Rollins McCulloch, Miss Patricia Moyer, MBE, and Miss Anne Stott. St. Felix Church, Miss Jean Cameron, Mr. William Clark, Miss Hazel Duncan, and Mrs. Elizabeth Robertson. Last but by no means least, we now recognise the members of Woodside Parish Church, Mr. Albert Buchan, Mrs. Cecilia or Ann Wodinski, and Mrs. Iris Swift. As you see from your orders of service, folk, there are there are quite a few people who couldn't manage to be with us tonight. We're not going to read out all their names, but can I suggest that we just gently give them also a hearty welcome. I think this year has been particularly busy because of 12 months when very little happened. And I sign them, but it's always a privilege uh, and a real pleasure to be present when actually people are in the seat of them. Uh, it, because to me, I, it, it is an absolute visible sign of the enormous service that has been given uh, over many years. I don't have enough of a quick calculator to work out what the cumulative total of your service of the people who have just uh, had their, their, their awards as elders, uh, the Boys Brigade, the yeah, Choir and, and, and Guild. But it does represent a tremendous service to the life of the Church and a faithful following of Jesus. And I know it says it's very bare, it says elder or guild member, that covers a whole host of different activities which you have brought to the service of Christ and His Church. What you have got in terms of your own expertise, your own experience, and not least of a considerable amount of time. And for that, the whole church is very grateful. And it is my privilege tonight, not only the fact that you've got a certificate, which I was pleased to sign, but actually that in person, I can say to you all, on behalf of the General Assembly, thank you very much indeed for all your service. Friends, we once again join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Blessed are you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for you have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. 
You chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world and destined us for adoption as your children. In Christ we have the forgiveness of sins an inheritance in your kingdom, the seal of your spirit, and in him we live for the praise of your glory. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We ask your blessing, especially this year, upon our moderator, Jim, and upon Rosie, as they carry out their duties and are ambassadors for you in our nation. May they feel you walking beside them to inspire, to encourage, and to uplift. God of all, of all people and places, of all times and all stories, we open our hearts to your world and all its people, bringing our hopes and our fears, and ready be to be transformed in our thoughts and our actions. God of love for all those divided from others by political, social or historical barriers, we pray. For all those whose lives are deemed worthless because of their gender or caste or race. For any whose voice is not heard because of their poverty or lifestyle or history. For all those whose hopes are rejected because of their sensuality or disability or identity. We pray for new understanding that would help us all to reach out to those we do not know, that all would know the fullness of life. God of wisdom for your church in all its diversity, we pray, that we might be one body recognizing the gifts of all our members that we might find unity in the shared questions of interpretation that we might forgive and be forgiven as we learn and grow together we pray for one church under the authority of our one head our lord and friend jesus christ god of compassion for all who need to know your care. We pray where the events and struggles of life pose difficult questions, where the loss of life, health or job bring pain, where abuse or addiction leave people feeling powerless. We pray that we would all know your presence and your healing and liberating touch. God of all, we open our hearts to your world and all its people now in silence, bringing our particular concerns and dreams and ready to be transformed in our thoughts and our actions. Almighty God, hear these and all our prayers through Jesus Christ, our friend and our master. Amen. Well, Teresa, I'd like to just say a very big thank you tonight to the congregation of High Hilton for hosting our annual presbytery service this evening. Normally, of course, it would have taken place at St Stephen's Church with our moderator, Maggie White. Maggie is on compassionate leave and our thoughts and prayers continue to be with her and the congregation of St Stephen's. But we're very grateful indeed to Hutton for standing in as moderator and to the congregation here. I'd also like to say a very big thank you to Cheryl. Cheryl Branken, our deputy clerk. There's been a lot more organisation involved in the service this year, and as always, Cheryl undertakes this with great enthusiasm, dedication and efficiency. So a big thank you to Cheryl for all her hard work over the past wee while in organising tonight's service.
And as Hutton mentioned earlier, we're going to have photos taken at the end. So after the service, if you just remain seated, and I'll just call out the church names for your cues. If you just come forward, and we'll have a photo taken with the moderator and your own minister, if he or she is present. And we're going to take two photographs. We're going to take one with masks and one without masks. The ones with masks um, can be used on church websites and Facebook pages and so on. The ones without masks are taken home and put into a file at home marked top secret. <laughs> Moderator, let's conclude. Shall I conclude? Let's conclude our service this evening by singing the great hymn To God be the glory, great things he has done. Let us now go out into the world in the power of Christ, as those who would see not only what the world is, but what we can make it be. And may our hand, our heart, and our voice be turned towards making it so. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all now and always. Amen. Amen.